Right, so this could be a long one, and it was all sparked off when I first saw this clip. A famous astrophysicist unwittingly walks into an interview with a flat earther and rage quits within an hour. Now that was taken from a video by our old friend Red Pill Philosophy. So conspiracy cats. And for those of you who don't know, that's this guy here. The one with the invisible ventriloquist dummy. Now in that video, Red Pill Philosophy was bragging that fellow Flat Earther Wakey Wakey had somehow managed to destroy an astrophysicist in some sort of debate. Now obviously nothing of the sort happened. What actually happened was, the Flat Earther Wakey Wakey had to lie to get an interview with the world-renowned astrophysicist Dr. Bergina, and then he proceeded to waste her time for well over an hour. I wanted to interview her, but how? I thought about it and I created an alias. David Howard from Oxford University Media Society and created some online material supporting this front. Now, I don't like lies, and I've not heard a whopper like that since Nathan Oakley decided to over-inflate his IQ test score. 13 and a half. Yeah, nobody believes it's that high, Nathan. Uh, anyway, the interview that Wakey Wakey had with Dr. Bergagina was a very, very long one, and it would have taken me maybe a two-hour video to rebuke every single point he made. So what I'm going to do is rebuke the first half of the interview in this video, and then if you in the comments section want to see the second half, I will oblige. So, this interview starts off with Wakey Wakey reminding us all about the dangers of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Also know of the Dunning-Kruger effect, a cognitive bias in which experts mistakenly assess their cognitive ability as greater than it is. Um, how much Dunning-Kruger do you have to suffer from to not even be able to interpret the Dunning-Kruger graph? Uh, wakey wakey, a little message for you. It is the novices, not the experts on a Dunning-Kruger graph who have an overinflated sense of confidence. Let me show you. Um, take a look at my Dunning-Kruger graph and see if you can spot where the flat earthers are in red compared to the experts in green. And a prime example of Dunning-Kruger is this flat earther here trying to educate us on well, something. Things in motion stay in motion. If not, if there's no vacuum or if there's no uh, no uh, friction to, to stop them, basically something like that. Isn't that the third law through dynamics? Uh, no, it wasn't the third law of thermodynamics. What you said was actually closer to Newton's first law, except you totally screwed it up. You're pathetic. You're all pathetic. So let's start by taking a look at the first killer question offered by Wakey Wakey. But before we do that, I want to make it very, very clear that I do not believe in any way, shape or form that I am anywhere near the same academic level as somebody like Dr. Bergagina. However, what I also believe is that in this interview, Dr. Bergagina was conned into thinking she'd be speaking to someone with at least some sort of scientific literacy. She didn't realise that she'd be speaking to someone that was going to try and use this video as some sort of victory dance on the internet. So rather than pick him up on every little thing, she was polite. She laughed a lot off. I won't be doing that. It is said that a spinning atmosphere has no border. There's no physical border between spinning atmosphere and the vacuum. And the atmosphere gets less pressured and becomes the vacuum of space. At what altitude would you say that the atmosphere stops spinning? Oh. So gravity they say pulls the air molecules to the earth, yes. but there's still some atmosphere molecules higher up. Yes. At what altitude would you say these atmospheric molecules stop spinning? So Wiki Wiki starts off unsurprisingly by talking about the vacuum of space next to our atmosphere, and he wants an exact height where our atmosphere is lost to space. Of course, there isn't an exact height, and it depends on a lot of different factors, as Dr. Bergagina begins to explain. Through, they escape through collisions also. They, there's the additional forces, they, they collide. So they the, collide with each other or yeah, with, with parts other. of the vacuum? With each other. Okay. Now I have no idea here why Wakey Wakey is asking if these particles will collide with something inside a vacuum. The only two possibilities could be that A, he doesn't know what a vacuum is, which wouldn't surprise me, or B, he does know what a vacuum is, but he's deliberately asking dishonest questions, which wouldn't surprise me. Um, anyway, let me expand on how collisions lead to us losing gas from the atmosphere. So a good analogy to use is these pool balls here. They're going to represent the gas particles in the atmosphere. And we can see that they're all moving at different speeds. They all have different energies. But they are colliding with each other. And when these collisions happen, a singular ball or a single molecule of gas in the atmosphere will either gain energy or it will lose energy. 
Now these collisions are happening at such an unbelievably high rate that we can almost assume that the energy of any one particular gas particle is, is sort of constantly changing. Now every now and then after a series of collisions, a lucky particle might pick up enough kinetic energy to be able to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. However, at lower altitudes, where the atmosphere is still quite dense, this energy is very quickly lost in another collision, meaning it's very, very difficult for particles lower down in the atmosphere to escape. However, when we get higher up in the atmosphere, where the density is a lot less, let's say the exosphere, then any lucky particle that manages to gain enough kinetic energy here has a much greater chance of leaving the atmosphere. So wakey wakey, it's really not that difficult. We have an observable pressure gradient. And when the density of the air gets low enough, particles then begin to have a fighting chance of escape. But there is no one finish line. Now, Dr. Bergina did try and explain this to you, but judging by the little photograph you put over this next clip, it seemed like you weren't listening at all. Yes, of course, it is defined by uh, density of the atmosphere, the gravity of the, magnet, of the planet. But for the Earth, I have to look up. If you want me to look up, I'll look up. No, that's I, fine. I don't know that number. But that's okay, because the fact that he wasn't listening meant that he could go on and ask loads more silly questions. And as this video goes on, you'll see that his lack of scientific understanding rivals even this. Mass is identical to weight, but this mass, this weight is space weight. But anyway, I digress. Uh, what other misunderstandings does he have regarding our atmosphere? Okay. And the reason that in mainstream astrophysics, in astrophysics that the vacuum doesn't suck out the gas is because the gravity is holding yeah. the gas to the earth. Yeah, exactly. Because everywhere else in science when there's a vacuum and gas it equilibrates. Yes. If you just take without gravity, yes, then they start to mix. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wakey wakey, vacuums do not suck. No scientist in the history of time has ever made the statement that vacuums suck. Children know that vacuums don't suck. So in this video already, you've claimed that things can collide with parts of a vacuum and that vacuum suck. Anyway, to help you out, I've made you a little bit of a song to teach you that vacuums do not suck. It's called Vacuums Do Not Suck. The vacuum doesn't... Doesn't what? The vacuum doesn't... Doesn't what? The vacuum doesn't... Go on, you can tell me. Suck out the gas. Yeah! The vacuum doesn't... Oh, they don't suck. The vacuum doesn't... No, they don't suck. The vacuum doesn't... Go on, finish it off. Suck out the gas. Oh, teamwork. It's quite catchy. Uh, anyway, the irony continues. And you'll notice that while he was claiming vacuum suck, he was showing this clip here of a tanker being crushed by the weight of the air around it as the air is pulled down by gravity. So with that out of the way, follow me for the rest of the video as we bounce from one childish misunderstanding straight onto the next. On to the next question. Mm -hmm. uh, it is written in, in astrophysics that the rotation of the Earth is due to, we can't feel it because of constant velocity. Oh dear. It's that time again. No, 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 no. Speed and velocity are not the same thing. And your misunderstanding of this is central to about 90% of the mistakes that you are about to make. Watch this little clip, right? It's gonna be time really well spent for you. When we travel, for example, on a roundabout, we can be traveling at exactly the same speed at all the points around that roundabout. However, as these arrows show, the direction that speed is acting in, the direction we are moving, is not constant. In a circle, that direction is constantly changing. Velocity is speed in a given direction. Therefore, our velocity is anything but constant. Our velocity, when we travel in a circle, is changing all of the time, constantly. In this picture you can see here, at the top of the circle, we have all of that velocity going in the left to right direction, or the x component, the x direction. In the arrow that's pointing downwards, we have all of that velocity in the y direction. We have had a massive change in velocity there. And when we're at this point on the circle, we have some velocity in both of those directions, but we are losing the velocity in the x direction and gaining it in the y direction. So even though the speed, the linear speed is the same, we are experiencing a loss of velocity in one direction and a gain of velocity in another. Now, given that acceleration is changing velocity over time, and we have a constantly changing velocity, we therefore have a constant acceleration. Now, this acceleration, we could call it a centripetal acceleration, you might use the term centrifugal, but it's trying to throw us off the Earth all of the time. Fred, does that make sense? Stupid math equations don't prove shit. Yeah, well, I, 
I haven't got to the equation yet, but I think maths can do quite a lot. Maths so proves you're a dick. That's what it that's proves. Nice. nice. Anyway, let's take a look at that equation now, shall we? But we also have an acceleration pulling us towards the center of the Earth, caused by gravity. So the acceleration that we feel constantly is going to be the gravitational acceleration pulling us inwards, minus that acceleration trying to throw us off the Earth caused by the spin. Now, the gravitational acceleration pulling us towards the Earth is not far off 10 meters per second squared, compared to the 0.03 meters per second squared, which would be the acceleration trying to throw us off the Earth. So, of course, the net result of that is we feel a firm acceleration towards the ground. So, our observed acceleration due to gravity is actually a resultant of two different accelerations. The acceleration caused by the Earth's spin, that's trying to throw us off the Earth, and the acceleration caused by the Earth's mass, or gravity, which is trying to pull us down to the centre of the Earth. Let's see how more confused Wakey Wakey can get. Now, one astrophysics guy I met... And I've got a feeling by that, it just means a flat Earther with a telescope. He said there are two constant speeds. Mm -hmm. Let me show you this. Yes. A bit like this fairground ride. Yes. Mm -hmm. And some people I know looked at some rotation physics. And by some people he knows and rotation physics, what he actually means is he got his mate to film a fairground ride. And they said if you're on the edge of this, mm -hmm. you would be experiencing acceleration and deceleration. It's only the middle point mm -hmm. that would experience like the wizard in the middle. Mm -hmm. The wizard would be constant velocity, mm -hmm. but if you're on the edge, you get, you get acceleration and deceleration. Mm -hmm. Right, now you're almost there, but just not in the way you should be. Um, you see, we do have, like we've explained, constant acceleration and deceleration. We constantly have velocity in the X component being reduced, decelerating, and velocity in the Y component increasing, and vice versa. It is so important that you do not forget that like you're about to. How would, how would you answer that? Well, I think I'd start by pointing this out to you. And then for the third time, I think I would try and stop you thinking in one direction only. You see, your entire problem, as you will reinforce for us in a minute, is that you are only thinking about motion in that X component. Here, you are simply thinking about acceleration at the top and deceleration at the bottom. Using your logic, if you were sat on a roundabout, you would feel a massive acceleration on one side of the roundabout and then a massive deceleration on the other side of the roundabout. You would feel as if you were being pushed and pulled in opposite directions constantly. And that is not what you feel on a roundabout. You feel one smooth, constant force. Your argument is flawed from the start. And of course, Dr. Bergagina reinforces a lot of what we said in this video, and that's that there are multiple accelerations, and we have to factor them all in before we decide what kind of force we're going to feel. So this is gravity of Earth, yeah. and that what uh, holds Earth together, and, and it, when it rotates, you experience this uh, acceleration on the edge of the Earth and the gravity towards the Earth. But when the Earth goes around the Sun, there is gravitational force towards the center of the Sun. So two gravitational forces produce this <clears throat> effect of acceleration and deceleration combination. Which was a good point that he totally ignores, like you're about to see. Conspiracy cats. What? I'm busy. We're going to visit We're... Harry Potter land. Right. Brilliant. Anyway, this idea still seems to be confusing our flat Earth friend. Wouldn't that mean we're not at a constant velocity so humans should feel the rotation of the Earth? We have already said that the velocity is constantly changing. It never stops changing and you don't understand that as you're about to prove with this graph that you don't understand. No, sorry, not, not that graph, this graph. The, mm -hmm. the, the astrophysicist I met, he did a model mm -hmm. showing that it mm -hmm. should show acceleration and deceleration. So I could actually show you a video where this goes mm -hmm. around the sun mm -hmm. and it shows, and even you can go onto the, I, the International Space Station, which is orbiting the Earth. And this also should be showing acceleration and deceleration due to the two constant motions, just like the fairground ride. Nice. Um, it's just a shame, though, that that graph is about as useless as a fire guard made of soup. Um, let's find out why. So here's his graph. That green line represents the 67,000 miles an hour that the centre of the Earth is moving around the Sun. And the dotted line uh, above and below it represents the speed of the equator relative 
to that centre of the Earth. Now I could be picky and say that the y-axis should be labelled as velocity instead of speed because clearly there's a directional aspect involved. But um, actually, you know what, stuff it. That y-axis should be labelled as velocity. But his graph has got far bigger problems than that. You see, this point here is represented by the peak at plus 1,000 miles per hour. And this point here is represented by the negative peak or the trough at minus 1,000 miles per hour. So do we know what comes next? Can we all spot what is not factored in? Can you? So yes. Oh, excellent. What is he missing? Okay. I'm sure you lot at home had much better luck. And I think we do know what comes next. You see, this red arrow here representing movement on that part of the equator, as we can see on the graph, seems to suggest that that part of the Earth is not moving any faster than the centre of the Earth. In fact, it seems to suggest that its only movement is that 67,000 miles per hour in that X direction. But that just isn't true, is it? The linear speed of the Earth at that point is still a thousand miles per hour. The velocity of that point in that Y direction is still a thousand miles per hour. And we've had to accelerate up to the velocity in that direction in the same way that we've decelerated in the X component. But your graph is only showing the deceleration in the X component, not the acceleration in the Y component. And as we've banged on about, if you wanna be able to predict the kind of forces you're gonna feel, you have to take all accelerations into account. So let me help you by plotting on the graph what you missed out. So here's your graph, yeah? Remember that one, the one that only shows us how the motion in the X component is changing. And because of the fact that it ignores all other motions and accelerations, that makes it pretty useless when trying to use it to determine the types of forces we should feel. Maybe we should plot the change in velocity in the Y component as well. You might get a line like this. And then you might understand that the acceleration we feel is actually going to be a combination of these accelerations, plus the acceleration we get as we move towards the sun. And then you might realise that you're not equipped to understand that, and you might go back to school and learn a little bit about circular motion. And then you might realise that everything you've said in this video so far is wrong. Of course, you could always just ignore everything I've said here, and you could desperately try to assign some sort of significant meaning to this otherwise completely meaningless graph. So wakey wakey, let me ask you a question and be honest to yourself with the answer. When you are on a roundabout, do you feel when it's spinning you in the east direction and then the west direction that you're being yanked one way and then the next? And do you feel no force when you're being spun in the north and south direction? Or do you feel a constant force all the way around? Because what I'm saying is right and what you're saying is wrong. I'm not really into science. Oh, don't worry, mate. It was a rhetorical question. Uh, anyway, I can see that you own quite a lot of herbs. Out of all the herbs you know, which one do you think is the funniest? Sage. <laughs> okay. Well, I can't say it does it for me, but whatever floats your boat. Uh, anyway, let's get back to Wakey Wakey. And just for fun, let's humour him with this. You see, you seem to be trying to make a big deal out of the fact that the Earth is moving. So let's take a stationary Earth and say that the top point in that X direction, it's travelling at 1,000 miles per hour at the equator. And then a minus 1,000 miles per hour at the equator down at the bottom of that picture. That gives us an overall change in velocity of 2,000 miles per hour. So remember, our acceleration in that X component is going to be change in velocity divided by time taken. So for this example, it's going to be 2,000 miles per hour divided by 12 hours. And what you'll notice then is if I start moving the Earth at 67,000 miles per hour to the right, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever to the acceleration you're going to calculate anyway. Because the difference in velocity is still 2,000 miles per hour. And it's still going to take 12 hours for the Earth to go from one of those positions to the other one. So I'm really not sure what you were trying to prove anyway. So what do you say to all of that then? Yeah. So this is a question I've, I can't get answered. It's a very interesting one. No, it's a very silly question that makes no sense at all. It's almost as bad as this one. You might be saying, that guy, why would they even invent gravity then? Why is there mass? What is this shit about mass? Anyway, next silly question, please. In the 1700s, mm -hmm. on the same theme, mm -hmm. uh, James Bradley did an experiment, which was redone in 1871 by a G. Airy. Obviously, this is a long time ago. And also the Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all these detected no rotation of the Earth. Mm -hmm. They have a silly question. No, no they what? detected no ether. Now all of those experiments named by Wakey Wakey are genuinely real experiments. But as Dr. Bergegina says, they were there to test for the presence of the ether. Given that the movement of the Earth was already established scientific fact, if the ether existed, we should be able to detect movement through it. However, the ether didn't exist. 
End of story. The only people who claim that these experiments prove anything other than a lack of an ether are scientifically illiterate YouTube flat earthers. I'm a stupid flat earther and I want to know where these mountains have gone. Exactly. Great example. So what mm -hmm. scientific method instrumentation or experiment would you say uh, proves the earth is rotating? What would be your first number one best proof if you were doing a lecture? Uh, that uh, the we see sunsets and sunrises, okay. <laughs> moonsets and moonrises, yes. Exactly. There's nothing wrong with that answer. Sunsets and sunrises, brilliant. We could add to that the two celestial points. We could add to that um, boats disappearing from the bottom up over the horizon. None of those things can be explained or predicted in any way, shape or form by any flat earth model that's ever existed in the history of time. <sighs> Still, Wakey Wakey thinks that he can debunk the sunset argument by showing us that wood isn't transparent. Brilliant. Uh, now, Wakey Wakey did ask for proof of rotation of the Earth via instrumentation. So, we've got a couple of options. Firstly, this clip is legendary by now. A 15 degree per hour drift. Of course, we all remember Flat Earther Bob Nadell telling everybody how easy it would be to measure the rotation of the Earth using a fiber optic gyroscope. And then when one of his colleagues got his hands on a fiber optic gyroscope, yeah, they easily measured the rotation of the Earth. Um, but my favorite, my favorite comes from a channel by this guy. This is Wolfie 6020, and I'm going to explain here and now what experiment he recreated, but I've linked his video in the description of my video right here, and I strongly urge you to click on it and go over to his channel, maybe even say hi from me. It's a fantastic video. So, what did he do? Well, do you remember early on in the video when we said this? The acceleration you feel towards the Earth, which is what determines your weight, is going to be calculated by taking the gravitational acceleration and then subtracting from it that outward acceleration, that centrifugal acceleration caused by the spin of the Earth. Well, that allows us to make a scientific prediction because of this. You see, when we fly west at, let's say, 600 miles per hour, we're not actually flying west. We are just moving eastwards 600 miles per hour slower than the Earth is rotating underneath us. So that means that we're essentially rotating slower now than the Earth, which means that the outward acceleration we talked about before is much, much less. However, the pull due to gravity towards the center of the Earth is still the same. So what does that mean? So according to this equation here, if that outward acceleration caused by the spin of the Earth is lower when we're flying west, then we should actually weigh a little bit more when we fly west, and vice versa. When we're flying east, we should weigh a little bit less. Now this is called the Eotvos effect and Wolfie6020's video on it, again linked in the description, is one of my favourite videos on the internet. And I'd really love to see what Wakey Wakey's got to say about that, but I will not be holding my breath. Uh, anyway, for now, in the rest of this video, he seems to be just descending into fairy tale land. So my, man, my feet, my feet are getting bigger. I grew four shoe sizes since I've started this programme. Yeah, well perhaps he doesn't get quite that bad, but still. It's funny because the Planck probe in 2013 did say we are the centre of the universe. I don't know yeah. if you ever studied that experiment. Now, interestingly enough, the Planck probe did actually produce some pretty interesting results. Um, if you Google Planck probe, axis of evil, you know what I'm talking about. And I'll be making a video on that pretty soon. But for now, how can any flat earther that doesn't believe in space travel because of this imaginary dome above the Earth, how can they even, with a straight face, think about using data from the Planck probe to support any sort of argument? I'm just going to use that as an admission that Wakey Wakey now realises uh, that rockets do indeed work in space. So, well done Wakey Wakey, welcome to the club. Uh, anyway, here's what Dr. Bergegina had to say about that. We see that all galaxies are uh, moving away from us. Does it mean that we're really in the centre of the universe, yeah? yeah? And then come the most ridiculous question of all. Well, if it's fusion, isn't that just bubbles of air in water? No, 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 not that one. This one. Let's go on to gravity. Uh... This has probably come across as a very obscure question. No, it, it comes across as a type of question that one of the 11-year-old kids that I teach might ask. The type of question that when they ask it, I'd explain the answer and they'd instantly understand it and wonder why they were ever confused in the first place. That's the type of question it comes across as. So, these people said to me, gravity is strong enough to hold boats and cargo and cars mm -hmm. to a spinning ball, but yet it's not strong enough to pull the butterfly down or these small areas of these dead flowers. How would you answer that? Well, first I'll point this out to you. Mm -hmm. 
and then I'd show you this. And then I'd expect you to look at that equation and see where it says m1 and m2 and then finally understand that the force of gravity or the size of the force of gravity between two objects is dependent upon the mass of both objects. The m2 will represent either the mass of the butterfly or the mass of the big boat. Obviously the big boat has a much bigger mass therefore the force of gravity is going to be bigger. Imagine taking two magnets, a strong magnet and a weak magnet or a strong magnet and another strong magnet. Which two are going to experience the greatest force between between them, the two strongest magnets. And here we're experiencing a force between masses. So which is going to experience that biggest force? It's going to be the two biggest masses. Add to that that a butterfly's also got wings and can generate its own up thrust. Oh, you know what? This is year nine science. I give up. And you know what? If you actually removed M2 from that equation, you'd end up with our about 9.8 meters per second squared which is the observable and repeatable rate at which things accelerate towards the ground when we drop them on Earth. Funny that, isn't it? Could gravity be explained away with density and buoyancy? No. That would only make sense to somebody that has absolutely no clue what buoyancy and density mean. Ah. You see, we can see the equation for buoyancy here, and we can see that g is the gravitational acceleration. And what is the gravitational acceleration? Oh yeah, it's what you get when you remove m2 from this equation, because the gravitational constant times the mass of the Earth divided by the radius of the Earth squared gives us our gravitational acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared. And density isn't even a force, it's just the measure of how much material is packed into a certain spot. No scientist in the history of time or space has ever even suggested that density is anything close to resembling a force. Um, but if you are still sure that density is the reason or the cause for anything, then answer me this question. If I take, or well, let's say, I don't know, your average flat earther's bedtime reading, and I drop it, it's going to fall. And you would say that's because it is more dense than the air around it, which it is. But the question that I have to have answered is why down? The air above the book is, if anything, less dense than the air below it. So if this book is going to move into a, a less dense medium, why does it choose to go down rather than going up? Why does it choose to move into the increasingly denser air rather than the increasingly less denser? Why doesn't it choose to go to the sides? Now, the answer... There is no gravity. There's just up and down. Yeah, that answer. That answer will not do Wakey Wakey because it's absolute tosh. I want to know if density and buoyancy are all we need. Why this chooses to fall downwards? Maybe it's psychic. Maybe it can see the floor underneath. And maybe it knows that it's going to upset some scientifically illiterate flat earther if it falls in any other direction than down. So it's doing it on purpose. Maybe. I doubt it. Maybe it's to do with something else. Some sort of force that's providing that directional influence. Some sort of force that's pulling things towards the ground. I can't think what that might be called. Gravity, right? Now, this video did actually take quite a long time to make due to the sheer volume of points that needed addressing, and I'm not even halfway through his main uh, interview yet. So, if you want a part two, let me know, and I will make a part two, and a part three if necessary, to go through all the points you made. But if you think I've made my point, and I think we all know what point it is I'm making, uh, if you think I've made my point, then uh, let me know, and I'll not bother with the part two or three, I'll move on to something else. But there was one more thing, something hugely important, Something so important I couldn't possibly leave this out.